Hello everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we will listen to the first part of the memoirs of German Colonel Steidl Leuitpold, Regimental Commander of Paulus's 6th Army. The beginning of the war, the 1st of September, 1939. The windows of my office in Munich are wide open. It is impossible to shut out such a beautiful late summer day. I press the radio button and immediately at full power and from 5.45 there is return fire. War has been declared on Poland. So it has begun after all. For several weeks already, there had been debates and doubts about the risky policy on the brink of war, which in 1938 led to the annexation of Austria and the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, in 1939 to the destruction of the Czechoslovak state and the occupation of the Mimel region. It would not end well. Eventually the denouement will come. We discussed the Anglo-French guarantees to Poland and the Soviet-German non-aggression pact, and now, after all, war again. He remembered the horrors of the First World War. The dead, the groans of the wounded, the scorched earth, on which even now, twenty years later, we can still see where battles raged with the massive use of all kinds of heavy weapons. War again. In the name of what? I glance at my desk, the workplace of a tactics teacher at the Munich Military School. Here are piled extensive materials for a paper on the offensive against fortified areas, that is, on the defences of the enemy. So I was mistaken in hoping that someday the policy of provocation would cease and the world would stabilise. I was aware of the Wehrmacht's combat training plans and I knew the purpose of officer training. When we invaded Austria in March 1938, Colonel Pernhauer, commander of the 61st Infantry Regiment, said to me, this will not end well, Steedle. And so it did. Munich in September 1939 reflected the general mood. There was no trace of the enthusiasm of the first weeks of August 1914. There was no singing in the streets Germany, Germany above all, or hold fast in the thick of battle, or the call rang out like thunder. This time we entered the war without noise, bewildered. Only the grief of wives and mothers was the same as before. In the Sapper School in Dissauroslaw. The first year of the war. Until December 31, 1940, I was assigned as a tactics teacher to the bomb school in Dessau Roslo, the head of which was then Colonel Medem. As the only tactics teacher here, I had to deal practically with all the subjects taught to the future officers. The main focus was on teaching theoretical and practical knowledge of how to conduct combat operations together with supported troops mainly to attack fortified areas. At the same time, special attention was paid to the tactical use of all types of weapons supporting the advancing infantry, especially interaction with sappers and the use of modern means of close combat. This gave me the opportunity to write a rather large paper on the preparation and conduct of an offensive on one section of the Maginot Line. Another paper was devoted to the question of the use of shape charges, developed by that time in Dissauroslo, which served mainly to undermine the armoured turrets of tanks. In 1940, when the Blitzkrieg against France was launched by airborne operations in Belgium and Holland, and Hitler's 1939 guarantees of neutrality for Belgium and Holland were flagrantly violated, I was assigned to give a tactical assessment of one of the first battles, a surprise attack on the Belgian fort of eBay email. The experience gained while teaching at military schools allowed me later, during the fighting in the Soviet Union, to critically assess the requirements of the high command to the active troops, as well as the level of tactical training necessary for their fulfilment. Among the students of the school in Dissau Roslo, there was also a Chinese Captain Chang Wiko, son of Chiang Kai-shek, who wanted to improve his military technical knowledge in Germany. I first met him during a training and demonstration trip of all schools to the eastern border regions. I then showed him the field of the historic Battle of 1410, and also explained to him the course of the fighting at Tannenberg in 1914. However, Captain Chang Wiko was not the only Chinese officer who studied in German military schools. We trained from them mainly specialists in modern weapons. Obviously, this cooperation was still connected with the agreements that were once concluded between the Reichswehr and Chiang Kai-shek, as is known. In the 20s, many Reichswehr officers served as instructors in the Chinese Marshal's Bourgeois Army, and passed on here their experience of the civil war gained in the struggle against the German working class. Operation Sea Lion was a major diversionary manoeuvre in February-March 1941. By this time I had been transferred as Lieutenant Colonel and Battalion Commander to the 61st Infantry Regiment in Munich. 
I took part in a major troop exercise on the coast of Belgium and Holland. We all assumed that this is the preparation of Operations Sea Lion, as the plan was then called Landing in England. Later we learned that Sea Lion was cancelled back in October 1940, and that our exercises were to serve as a disguise for the planned aggression against the Soviet Union. At that time, however, no one knew the nature and degree of difficulty of the task set, which required from us, land rats, a huge effort. There was no doubt that training for the jump across the channel was underway. The culmination was a two-day exercise, during which battalions in full combat gear, reinforced with light artillery, heavy mortars, anti-tank and infantry guns, were trained to load onto and unload from two and four thousand ton transport ships. In addition, on the banks of the canal subject to the ebb and flow of the tides, we practiced towing pontoons with full loads, as well as landing infantry, although it was in the coastal towns that enemy intelligence operated superbly. We were only once raided by British aircraft. Oberlutent Wetjerek. A sweltering heat floated over the barracks built near one of the outer forts in the northeast of Warsaw. The June sun had been blazing all day. The shade from the few trees could not prevent tar from dripping from the toll-covered roofs. We were depressed, however, by something else. The presence of an SS man who had been assigned to my battalion headquarters a few days before. Up to now we had not been shy or concealed in our circle our doubts about the events that were taking place. Now we had to keep a different attitude. We Churik. That was the name of the Oberlutnant sent from the SS headquarters in Munich. Made us feel this very soon. Toward us he was emphatically cordial. But if he wanted to get his demands from a field sergeant from the battalion headquarters, he became strict and gave orders in a harsh tone. Obviously, he wanted to emphasize his special position. This manifested itself in the fact that he used Nazi jargon and asked provocative questions. However, this had no effect on us at all. During the last months, when our regiment was between Brussels and Antwerp in the reserve of the main command, we officers became firm friends. Several weeks of strenuous training had passed. In accordance with orders, it was conducted mainly at night and at dawn and ended with a command and staff exercise, during which the middle and junior command staff familiarized themselves with the terrain and roads in the area extending to the bug. There was talk that we were preparing for an offensive against the Soviet Union. At the beginning of May my father died. I received a short leave of absence. Returning from Munich, I stopped in Vienna. I was interested in how the Viennese felt about the Third Reich. Now their attitude had changed considerably. Notable internal resistance led to the fact that Hitler thoroughly pressed return to the fold of the Reich. In all troop headquarters of the Austrian army were sent Nazis, officers of all ranks and arms. Military school in Vienna was turned into a citadel loyal to Hitler commanders and teachers of military disciplines. While in Munich, I met at the headquarters of the VI military district with old friends. Co-workers from the First World War, including a close friend. Before I left, he secretly handed me the latest maps. They were maps of the Soviet Union up to the Urals. These materials caused a kind of sensation in the regiment. Vyshorek appeared and began to boast of his knowledge of Hitler's intention to economically fragment the Russian colossus and deprive it of its spiritual independence. This side of the Barbarossa plan seemed to be known to him in every detail. Warsaw Ghetto. We were depressed, however not only by the thought that in the not-too-distant future there would probably be an attack on the Soviet Union, the whole atmosphere in Warsaw had an even greater effect on us. Of course, all of us, some more than others, had heard something about the final solution of the Jewish question, about the extermination of all opponents of fascism. In the fit, we had even seen and done. In the First World War and on the Western Front in the Second, but Warsaw was something completely different. The streetcar went then. Without stopping through the ghetto, the part of the city where the Jews were driven and where we are mucked soldiers were strictly forbidden to enter. Even so, one could see that something terrible was going on there. Wichurek, however, believed that this was only the beginning and that there would be more to come. All the Jews would be driven into the ghetto, and then he smiled maliciously. Goebbels' propaganda criminally inflated the inevitable complications arising from the disastrous living conditions of these tortured and tormented people and falsely presented them as proof of the degeneration and decline of people of Jewish nationality. The reality was different. One could judge from certain signs that the inhabitants of the ghetto, in spite of all the humiliation, tried to maintain order, inner firmness and fortitude. Whoever saw their eyes could understand their passionate, formidable hatred against those who, in fulfillment of Hitler's will, were exterminating hundreds of thousands of people 
trying to obliterate even the fact that they existed. In every house, in every room from the cellar to the attic, day after day, the sacred fire of hatred was kindled against the perverts. Pleas were made to God for vengeance against those who, in the sense of the Old Testament, belonged to those who bore the seal of damnation. Such was the atmosphere in which the heroic uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto broke out in 1943. My regimental commander, Colonel Perkauer, had the same attitude to all this as I did. Until now we had tried to ignore this side of fascism, the terror against other nations and against dissenters. Now, however, it was increasingly touching the depths of our souls. One could not escape it either sitting in one of the many cafes where cheerful music was playing, or in front of the famous Chopin monument, or even in church, where at any time of day a hundred believers placed candles before the icons. About once every two days we marched past the Essie's guarded prison camp, on the outskirts of Radzimin, behind three-metre-high barbed wire fences stretching along the street, hundreds of pitiful figures crowded together, begging for bread, only bread, bread. We all fell silent. The soldiers tried not to look around. When that section was left behind, most of us sighed with relief. At the beginning of June, I had to be an assessor at one of the trials in the military tribunal of the division. The accused was a German soldier. He was about 22 years old. He robbed a Polish woman, brutally raped her, and then killed her with a log. This was the only time in the trial that I had to participate in a life-or-death decision. I can't hide the fact that I was still going through the process for a long time, firstly because of the death sentence and secondly because of the details of the trial. There were witnesses who, in an attempt to ease the fate of the accused, claimed that he had only committed the crime because he had not been hardened from the many demoralizing phenomena of the many months of occupation. How could one seek excuses and explanations for such a heinous crime? And what did the demoralizing phenomena of the many months of occupation mean? Idleness or all that went on in the ghettos, in the SS camps, after all, in any Polish town, in any Polish village. The Poles were powerless outside the law. After all, they were Slavs, unto mention. People of an inferior race, they had no right to a living space, or even to live. Wasn't this the root of demoralization? and who were to be considered the real criminals? The march to the border. In the middle of June, we received an order to conduct a reconnaissance near the border. In the mess hall, the conversation revolved around the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, concluded in August 1939. We still believed that Hitler would honor this treaty. Day after day, trains of grain were coming from Russia to Germany. A violation of the treaty would have affected Germany's food situation. On the 18th of June, my regiment was ordered to requisition 600 horses and carts in a precisely designated area within 24 hours. The action was sudden and at first passed off as a police and veterinary action. Already at four o'clock in the morning, the settlements were surrounded and therefore it was impossible to steal the horses. The peasants were ordered to bring the horses within one hour to determine their suitability for use. Then the selection began. The fit horses were taken away leaving only the old nags. The same thing happened with the carts. Now each company was given an additional piece of horse-drawn transportation. The goal was to guarantee the highest degree of mobility in the open, away from the big roads and the BF necessary. Off-road, heartbreaking scenes were played out, the peasants were desperate. Harvest was imminent, and what could be done without horses and wagons? The next night weapons, equipment, food, medicines and sappers were loaded onto these wagons. The movement was commenced on the night of June 20 and 21. The regiment in two transitions took positions east of the Bug, north of Malkini. Almost no one, however, believed that the situation was so serious. And in the past, it has happened many times that Hitler achieved his goal through military demonstrations. We began to doubt only after we received a message that several immobilized Soviet armies had come close to the border and that they were about to start advancing. Rumours of sabotage acts also reached us. However, the division headquarters knew almost nothing about the enemy, nor about how our command assessed the situation as a whole. After crossing the warsaw Ostrolenka railroad line at Wysko, the night march was conducted in complete secrecy. From Broke our regiment was already deployed. That is, with two battalions in the first echelon and with the third in reserve, after an exceptionally difficult crossing over rough terrain, came to the initial positions west of the railroad line Matkinia, Ostro, since it was necessary to pull the companies as close as possible to the Soviet border outposts. About five kilometers before the border all the lights were extinguished, 
dogs were caught, settlements and farms were combed. In the evening of June 21, commanders at the last operational meeting at the division headquarters, at Brock, was announced Hitler's order to attack. Now came the great hour for Vecherich, who was acting as second officer for Ehrens. He was literally reveling in the historic German mission in the fulfillment of which he was to participate. As I ascertained from numerous conversations with non-commissioned officers and soldiers, the troops had no idea of the German mission. The mood was depressed rather than cheerful, not only among the young soldiers who were going into battle for the first time, but also among those who had already smelled gunpowder. The vast expanse of the Soviet Union seemed to them a mystery. Only a few, in particular old officers, participants of the First World War, calmly waited for the development of events. The field maps given to us showed a deep, though not continuous, Soviet defence system. Data about it supposedly had been established as a result of recent reconnaissance flights. However, nothing was known about the nature of the individual defences or whether they were occupied by troops. The night was clear. One could clearly hear trains running on the double-track road Warsaw by Alice Stock, Vilna. The horse carriages survived the first test, although the road of the third category to Broke was occupied by marching columns along its entire width, which sometimes led to traffic jams. All preparations for the rapid crossing of the frontier outposts were completed. Our battalions were to first, moving on the left flank between the railroad right-of-way and the Broker Lowland to reach Zeremba, and then along the river to reach the height between Shoal Zero Roars and Andreve. The tasks of the day for the units entering the battle at the place Neur, as well as for the tank unit striking from the area Ostroa, were not reported to us. We assumed, however, that the second and third tank groups, advancing together with the ninth and second armies, supported by the fourth army, deep into the area of operational deployment of the enemy to cut off his troops from the rear. Such tactics had already been used during the campaign in Poland. In addition, we counted on the successful actions of mobile units in the direction of Bialystok. Everyone realized the seriousness of the situation. The task of approaching the Soviet border outposts as close and unnoticed as possible was accomplished. June 22, 1941. Five hours, 30 minutes. The next morning at 5.30 an artillery fire of unprecedented strength began along the entire border. Every object that could serve as a defence was suppressed. At the same time German aviation began massive raids. All this said that a carefully and well-prepared invasion had begun. A few minutes after the artillery preparation began, fires broke out. The forward units at the Soviet border outposts were quickly overturned. There was no resistance on my section. Only from the direction of Malkini was heard the noise of infantry fighting and explosions were heard. Continuously, almost on a strafing flight over us, flew to the east squadrons and individual bombers. It's like medical Captain Dr. Bergman, I followed with the battalion on horseback. Soon we reached a height with gentle slopes and a trigonometric sign. Here at the top, we saw the first and for those hours, the only dead man, an elderly border guard sergeant in an olive green uniform. After a kilometre, our advance was halted for a time by machine gun and rifle fire. Soon our lead marching outpost came across unfinished light field fortifications. There were no more soldiers in them. It was obvious from everything that the construction had been started recently. Skeins of barbed wire, wooden stakes, staples, boards and bags of cement were lying around. We were amazed at what we saw. There was nothing to confirm that the attack we had warned of was being prepared. Where was the enemy, about whom the Gobel's propaganda was saying that he was preparing to crush us with an unprecedented mass of men and weapons? When our regiment approached Schelborger, the first major settlement in our offensive strip, it was expected that there we would meet organised resistance. However, nothing happened. Division headquarters ordered us to move on as quickly as possible past the... In the following days, however, the picture changed. Our advance was disrupted and slowed by the stubborn resistance of Soviet military units who fought with exceptional skill, unexpectedly, and despite the clear superiority of the Nazi Air Force, Soviet fighter planes attacked with extraordinary courage from strafing flight our infantry units that were struggling to advance through fields, forests and swamps. They were flying over the boundless birch forests, almost hitting the tops of trees, bombarding the country lanes and trails, sowing panic in the German troops. Even before we reached the outskirts of Minsk, it became clear that we were facing a serious enemy. 
the treacherous attack on the Soviet Union, which was a violation of international law from the very first hours, caused terrible destruction and indescribable distress to the population. Everywhere one could see burned villages, stove stacks rising mournfully to the sky. In the ruins, uh, women, children, old men and old women, desperately digging through the garbage in the hope of finding a bucket, a pot or a cauldron for cooking food. One could not count on anything else. Here and there women bandaged their wounded children. These pictures are impossible to forget. For the first time I experienced the first day of the war at the front. For the first time I saw what the invasion brings to the civilian population, which is bombarded by artillery fire and brutal bombardment from the air. The first days of the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union allowed me to recognize the lie of preventive war and also disproved other false claims of propaganda. After repelling one of the enemy attacks, I found myself at night in a dilapidated village school. From a pile of books lying around, I randomly pulled one out. There used to be a library here which had been savagely destroyed. It was Heinz's poems in German, and I remembered the propaganda claims about the culturelessness of communist Russia. The Barbarossa plan envisioned a lightning defeat of the USS. The task was to destroy the Soviet armies within a few weeks. It was envisaged to take Leningrad and Moscow, as well as to occupy the Donetsk Basin, which was important in military and economic terms. The final goal of the operation was to reach the Volga Arkhangelsk line. Goering's green folder supplemented this plan with detailed measures for the economic robbery of the Soviet Union. Secret orders such as the notorious Commissar Order of June 6, 1941, or Richenot's Order of October 10, 1941, which served as a model for the orders of other commanders, were to ensure that the war against the Soviet Union would be waged ruthlessly and without regard for international law. The result was wanton destruction, terror against civilians, and brutal treatment of prisoners of war. In Miliatina, we learned that there they had driven hundreds of women, children and old people into a church, piled up the exits, and kept them locked up for days without food. After that, it was not difficult to complete the exterminar. The preliminary sorting had already been done. This is how Oberlunotent Wichurik commented on this terrible action. In general, he tried to teach us a lesson on how to interpret these orders. When Soviet soldiers were brought to the battalion headquarters, he pulled a pistol out of his holster and threatened the prisoners with execution. In attacking the prisoners with profanity, he tore their uniforms in search of documents. Any scrap of paper found with some kind of stamp he considered a commissar's pass. Finish them immediately. He yelled, Vakuri understood perfectly well what most of us thought of him and his behavior. Perhaps that was what kept him from having such orders enforced in our presence. Despite the fact that the regime of terror operated quickly and successfully, and that the economic robbery was in progress, the strategic goal of the Barbarossa plan could not be realized. The Red Army was not destroyed, although in the order for Army Group Center of July 8, the commander, Field Marshal von Bock, called the double battle for Bialystok and Minsk completed and cited dizzying figures of prisoners and trophies. We knew very well how the enemy's losses were determined. The figures were adjusted and embellished and our division began to include in the column captured and destroyed tanks any simple tracked armoured personnel carrier designed only for the transportation of gun crews. In this characteristic for Nazi propaganda, inflated reports of victories, individual regiments and even battalions tried to outdo each other. Meanwhile, we were convinced at every turn that the enemy is not broken. Three armoured divisions, the 10th, 17th and 18th, ahead of the V-Army Corps and, consequently, the 7th Division, which included our 61st Regiment, broke out in early July to the Berezina near Borisov. By this time, covering Minsk, the 19th, 12th, 20th and 7th Panzer Divisions had turned from the north. Thus, between Bialystok and Minsk formed a long, elongated cauldron of more than 200 kilometers, constraining large German forces. Despite this, under cover of night and obviously with the help of guides, the Soviet units managed to get out of the encirclement in groups. Our regiment was well aware of the success of these enemy actions, as we too were drawn into combat with these groups. After the effect of surprise was exhausted, the Soviets, using flexible tactics, put up stubborn resistance. At times they threatened us from all sides. They attacked our convoys and increased their firepower with ammunition and weapons captured from us. We had to fight hard around the clock. Even forcing small rivers required long preparation and special support measures. 
the Soviet command quickly recognized that it is relatively easy to inflict damage to German infantry regiments if you apply sudden concentrated attacks of infantry and tanks. Of course, it knew very well which roads or stretches of roads could be used for a more or less organized offensive and which places, with the gigantic size of the fighting, could not be viewed, much less defended by us. Therefore, Soviet troops at any time of day or night attacked our columns, broke up our essentially weak combat guards, broke up echelons of marching columns, and slowed down our advance. Before it was possible to organize the necessary countermeasures, at least improvised, the enemy disappeared. Stubborn battles on the Dnieper and Sos rivers. On July 10, a new offensive operation began. About 10 kilometers south of Mojilev, we reached the eastern bank of the Dnieper. The immediate task was to force the Sosh between Klimovici and Krit. The situation of the infantry divisions was at this time particularly difficult, because the tank corps that had broken out ahead, interacting with each other, made wide circular movements in all directions to destroy a number of small cauldrons. Between the tank formations and our division, there were centers of resistance, holding back our advance, forcing us to go on the defensive and reducing our combat effectiveness. My battalion, then it was the first reinforced battalion of the 61st Infantry Regiment, had to defend on the road Mojilev, Krychev, Roslavil literally on two fronts. The advancing Soviet units, for example, it was not difficult to completely dismember the head regiment of the marching column, stretching for 20 kilometers for 24 hours, suddenly appeared with his headquarters. General Geard with his headquarters, General Geer von Schweppenberg, commander of the Exixiv Panzer Corps. The headquarters was assigned to protect a large number of tanks, with the help of which he eliminated the dangerous situation for us. Stubborn fighting also unfolded for Mojilev, which at this time was 200 kilometers behind the tip of the German tank wedge. In order to break the resistance of three Soviet divisions, it was necessary to introduce seven German divisions, including parts of ours Munich. These seven divisions were held here for a whole week. Some time later, we took up a circular defense near Klimovici, from which a Soviet army unit had withdrawn shortly before. Apparently, it was well equipped with engineering equipment because the attempt of my battalion to move south the same evening failed. Less than one and a half kilometers from the town, all the paths suitable for movement were mined, and moreover, Wooden mines are particularly difficult to detect. General Geer von Schweppenberg, who asked me to give a detailed assessment of the operational situation, agreed to inspect a particularly skillfully camouflaged resistance node of the enemy, which was captured only at the cost of heavy losses. It was about a hundred-year-old grove occupying about a hectare and a half. In time immemorial, someone dragged boulders and cobblestones dug out by plough. Here it was possible to create shelters relatively quickly. The Soviet unit fought to the last drop of blood, destroying almost the entire German unit. Almost all our soldiers and officers, who not expecting to meet resistance, entered the forest from two sides, were killed, and only two other companies managed to advance with the help of heavy mortars. Stubborn resistance stopped our advance. The next day my battalion was assigned the task to reach the line of the Besid River east of Klimovici, and then turn to the road klimovici Roslav. During demining, my practical experience received in the demining school in Dessauros law came in handy. Thus, I and two soldiers from the attached sapper company managed to disarm two perfectly camouflaged mine barriers. On the same day, there was an unexpected clash with Soviet motorized riflemen, which ended with great losses. Only after that, the road to Roslavl became free. There, we re-established contact with the regiment. The town gave the impression of a deep rear. On all corners were nailed signs and conventional signs of tank and motorized rifle units. A church built in the early Middle Ages with powerful walls and vaults was occupied as a temporary fuel depot. A neighboring building had been blown up. Apparently it was a mill warehouse as the road was covered with spilled grain. Nearby, mountains of papers and books were being burned and small folders of reproductions of paintings were thrown into the fire. Stunned, I watched the art treasures being ruthlessly destroyed. I saw the same picture in one of the city's neighborhoods, where the houses were drowned in orchards and flowers. They now housed the headquarters. When I entered one of the houses, two stamp albums were being thrown into the fire. Before I could intervene, they were burned. The inhabitants of the house, poor, helpless people, old men and teenagers, boys and girls, watched with despair and horror how the German soldiers behaved. 
Perhaps at the commander's meeting, the situation finally became somewhat clearer. The Red Army is very firmly entrenched in the Upper Desna and Ugral, the most important road junctions on the way to Moscow along the highway Roslavel Moscow and railway stations. On the line Smolensk Moscow became bastions of stubborn resistance. Only at Yelnya it was possible to advance far into the enemy's location. The so called Yelnya Ark was formed. Realizing the danger of the situation, the Red Army commands sought to strike at the Yelninsky Ark. Our defensive positions were subjected to continuous pressure both from the north and from the south. Our 7th Division was given strict orders not to retreat. It looked as if positional warfare would unfold here with equipped firing points, strong points and trench system as we still vividly remembered it from the First World War. Everywhere they began to dig holes for listening posts in the pre-field. Rear communications were provided by earth embankments. Here and there barbed wire fences were erected. Those who had hoped to make do with improvised defences were sorely mistaken. Red Army units were striking at one place and another. The Soviet artillery performed admirably. Movement during daylight hours became quite impossible. Soviet reconnaissance from the air was conducted continuously. And yet, the German command was clearly convinced that Moscow could still be taken this fall. In those days, I visited the graves of fallen comrades. The soldiers' cemetery was located on a hillside near a small lake. The son of my old friend Baron von Reitheim, who died a few days after arriving at the front from Munich, was buried there. Suddenly the order came to raise all the graves immediately, for we had to reckon with the possibility of retreat. A few days later we retreated from the area of the Yelninskaya Ark, sizing this operation with diversionary actions in our section. The Soviets, obviously well aware of our movements, inflicted heavy damage on us. The battle for the crossroads at Shelkovka. At the end of September, the offensive on Moscow began. Powerful tank formations and motorized units developing the offensive from the area of Bryansk, Yelnya, Smolensk to Kalinin and Tula were to take Moscow in pincers. In fierce fighting, at the cost of heavy losses, managed to capture Kalinin and Oral and reach Tula. The appearance of the advancing German troops completely changed. If in the first weeks of the war in Russia still tried to strictly observe the statutory order and discipline, now it all looked different. In the advancing troops could be seen peasant carts with wicker basket-like boards, often harnessed to a single nag. The carts were used by soldiers, mostly with sore legs. They did not want to go to the rear. It was already rainy season and it was very difficult to move in the direction opposite to the advance of the troops. The rains turned the roads into quagmires in which horses drowned and men got stuck. Sometimes it was impossible to escape from these clutches. Everyone envied the tankers. Naturally, the attackers did not notice that often these giants of technology got stuck. After in the last decade of October, the Red Army stopped our offensive operations about a hundred kilometers from Moscow and near Tula. The main command of the ground forces began to concentrate on the Moscow direction more and more troops. As is known, Hitler intended to enter the Soviet capital at least late in the fall. On the roads formed incredible traffic jams and crowds of people and vehicles. For the few but carefully prepared surprise raids by Soviet aircraft, these were extremely favorable targets. At this time, the most important operation for the 7th Division R Regiment had already lost more than 40% of its personnel, was the battle for the crossroads at Shelkovka, which had been taken by the 10th Armored Division of the XL Tank Corps on October 24. Shelkovka was one of the key positions of Moscow's defensive belt. Here, the old post road, along which Napoleon once marched to Moscow, the new highway and the Smolensk-Moscow railroad line crossed the road running north-south. Just after we replaced the tank division, which however failed to hold its position, the Red Army units launched a counter-offensive and retook the fortified road junction. Only in early November we managed to repulse Shelkovka. We had to put into action three divisions and strong tank units, the battle for this junction of roads, which provided the supply of goods, and the advance of the German army to Moscow, for more than a week constrained the German troops and reduced their combat effectiveness. To Moscow, three train yet of eight kilometers. Army Group Center concentrated more than 50 divisions, including 20 tank and motorized divisions, to strike a direct blow to Moscow on November 16. Twenty days later, German troops reached the line of the Moscow-Volga Canal, Krasnaya Polyana, Kriukovo, Kashira, to Moscow 25 km. The main command of the armed forces believed 
that the realized breakthrough is tantamount to the fact that the Soviet combat power is exhausted. This was another self-deception. The same self-deception was the assumption that from positions along the Minsk-Moscow highway and around Nero fominsk it was possible to reach the outskirts of the Soviet capital. It was supposed to launch another offensive on Moscow through the para in the first days of December. Apparently, the rumor of this spread with the speed of the wind. When on November 28 I returned from reconnaissance of the new starting point east of Shelkovka, I did not believe my eyes at first, who only did not come to us. Representatives of various arms, reconnaissance teams of headquarters, representatives of the Corps' command, who had never before been seen so close to the front line, senior SS officers with an entourage in the form of a convoy team, representatives of the headquarters of the Reichskommissars, the Sonderführer for Agriculture, labor recruitment offices. Everyone obviously counted on the fact that here, on this highway, he would be able to witness an event of world significance, the fall of Moscow. We, the front-line soldiers in tattered uniforms, made a pitiful impression in comparison with these well-dressed rear guards. But in those days, the soldiers got what they saw only rarely, a bottle of beer, cigarettes, sausage, cheese and chocolate. We also got to listen to broadcasts from the homeland in a perfectly equipped mobile radio station. None of us believed what the German stations were broadcasting, claiming that the situation in Moscow was dire. Everyone had long since fled the Kremlin, and Stalin was somewhere in the Urals. Entry into Moscow was only a matter of days. In the settlement between the ruins there was fighting again. This time the last chickens were their victims. The drunken brawls were disgusting. S officers quarrelled with tankers over a hut and a well, and this was only 35 kilometres from Moscow. A liaison officer brought a package, from which it was clear that our division should together with the 292nd Division to concentrate for the offensive south of the highway Shelkovka, Moscow on the hills between marks 211 and 204, the left flank along the highway Naro for Minsk. Mo Most of the units of our regiment had to change during the night of November 28-29 and move to the new starting areas. As before any responsible operation, the regimental commander, Lieutenant Colonel von Spies, assembled us that very night. For the first time in weeks we were briefed in detail on the situation. Our commander marked the front line on the map with pedantic precision, sometimes only to compare often contradictory reports. According to these reports, until a few weeks ago, large Soviet formations were surrounded and remained behind German lines. The cauldrons formed near Vyazma and Bryansk could not be destroyed. Most of the personnel of the encircled groups managed to escape from the encirclement. Now it became clear to us what meant so dangerous for our company's sudden attacks of the enemy. On October 14, the city of Kalinin, formerly Tverby, was taken. The Red Army stopped the German offensive on the line Tula, Volokolmsk, the Kalinin, Silisharovo. Now the front line northeast of our part passed through Zenigorod, Didovsk, Krasnaya Polyana to Yakroma on the Moscow Volga Canal. On the ground, there was an acrid smoke, a mixture of the exhausting odors of chowder, burnt meat, vapors from the trebuchets, and burning tar. We are standing near Moscow as victors, and before our mental gaze in a blood-red glow appear burning city blocks, countless domes of cathedrals, and the walls of the Kremlin. I wish it would come true soon. Thus roughly one of us drew in his imagination what we were to see for real. The pictures before Napoleon saw a counter-offensive on a thousand-kilometer front. In the early morning of December 3, nothing heralded disaster. It was a cold winter day. Suddenly from the south came the rumble of battle. Strong Soviet battle groups managed to break through the front with the support of massive artillery fire. Having taken prisoners, the Russians disappeared as quickly as they had appeared. It seemed that our section had all the prerequisites for a successful offensive. However, in 24 hours everything changed. My battalion, carrying out a limited combat mission, found itself in the midst of preparations for a Soviet offensive, the scale of which we had no idea yet. After combing through the forest, company commanders led their platoons to attack across an open field a kilometer and a half ahead to the outskirts of a major population center when suddenly a hurricane fire was opened on them. This last offensive of my battalion near Moscow ended in disaster. Almost all the officers and soldiers were killed. The infantry and anti-tank guns, as well as the sapper platoons, which were on the edge of the forest in readiness for a rush, were completely destroyed by barrage fire. 
On the 5th of December began heavy airstrikes on rear communications and source areas where hitherto one could feel safe. The Red Army launched a general offensive on a wide front, as a result of which the German troops were pushed back in some places up to 400 kilometers. Several dozen of the most combat-ready German divisions were defeated, on both sides of the highway lay dead and frozen. This was the prologue to Stalingrad. The Blitzkrieg had finally failed. Deadly tired and sick. I was at regimental headquarters when the first fateful news arrived. Bronchitis, which I had been carrying on my feet for several days already, was joined by nephritis, and my temperature was very high. I was evacuated with the first wounded who arrived from the front line, and I found myself in a hellish situation of flight. Clogged roads, aerial bombardment, panic fear of T-34 tanks that had already broken through, partisan attacks. Only after Moshaisk we came to our senses. The wounded were evacuated from the field infirmary in Borisov. Everyone who was considered transportable was expelled. There were not enough sanitary trains. Shaking with fever, I spent two days in a freight car, sitting on a camp suitcase. After a long layover on an alternate track, our echelon moved on. The wagon was shaking unbelievably. It was cold as hell from below and stinking from above. It was incredibly cold day and night. In the carriage I was told of terrible crimes. In one place the SS burned civilians in a church together with their priest. On one of the steep banks of the Berezina River, they drove off and shot hundreds of people and dumped the corpses into a dried-up reverb. A mountain of corpses rose above the riverbed, and caterpillar tractors were driven over them to flatten them. The spring flood would carry away the remaining corpses. I reached Munich via Warsaw. There I introduced myself to the commandant, passed a medical check, and was immediately sent to the reserve infirmary, Crankenhale near Bad Tolls. Before the infirmary I visited home. Did they know about the catastrophe near Moscow? The children were eager to learn more interesting things from there, thanks to their youthful curiosity and naive ignorance of what was happening in the East. They still had an idea of the war as an exciting adventure, and they were proud that their father had been at the front. The same thing was happening to them that was happening to us in August and September 1914. The young people apparently had not changed. At the same time, they were cursing the Hitler Youth and the Imperial Labour conscription at every crust. I caught on to the fact that there was already a disagreement among the relatives on the question of attitudes towards the Nazis. However, in every family someone had been drafted into the army. There was not a word in the newspapers about what had played out near Moscow. Reports of the Soviet offensive were masked by statements about the levelling of the front, the planned occupation of new initial positions. Settlements were hardly named. And when after my recovery I went to the Corps District Office, it turned out that even there they knew almost nothing about the recent events near Moscow. General Dittmar Saprovodil in radio commentary a series of defeats, high-flown verbiage. I was assigned to lecture on the battles in the East. It was an opportunity to present everything unvarnished. However, it was difficult to ensure that wishful thinking was not mistaken for reality. I was interrupted with questions about Soviet tactics. They testified that my conclusions based on experience were viewed with skepticism. I was asked, well, did you see Moscow? I shook my head in the negative. But they knew that from Munich to Freising 33 kilometers, and from Kubinka to the outskirts of Moscow only 28. But there were no heights like Brahusberg near Freising, from which Munich could be seen. The snow hadn't melted yet. The general in charge had ordered a drill of reserve units on the Frotmanit Heath to practice the advance of infantry and supporting units using the latest winter equipment. The theme of the exercise was clearly far-fetched. Piles of gravel chosen by the excavator were used as shelters, which simplified the conventionally accepted situation since there were no such shelters at the front. I felt uneasy. In my mind I saw my soldiers there in the east as they repeatedly and unsuccessfully attack, and then the attack is smothered in a last desperate fight. The Red Army now and then opens fire with all barrels and hits the German infantry. All the experience gained in battles and spoke about the need to fully utilize the terrain. In these December days was completely useless for my soldiers. During the debriefing exercises in the dining room of the Turkish barracks, it was extremely difficult to convey the frontline atmosphere. It was a question of statutes. Our frontline experience was not of interest. We were afraid to shake the blind faith in the superiority of German tactics and German weapons. In March 1942, 
I was promoted to colonel and appointed commander of the 767th Grenadier Regiment of the 376th Infantry Division. In the first winter campaign in Soviet Russia, this division suffered heavy losses, was withdrawn from the Eastern Front and transferred to Southern France for reforming. My regiment was stationed at Barbezieu, near the old Episcopal residence of Anguli. I wished to become better acquainted with my officers. The adjutant of the regiment, Oberlieutenant Streng, the son of a pastor from Firth, and the commissioned officer, Oberlieutenant Urban, of a Viennese merchant family. For this purpose, I took them alternately with me on trips. The new division commander, General Edler von Daniels, was with his headquarters at Angulim in a small castle. It was thought that his arrival was somewhat premature. He appeared here and there, inspecting newly formed units driving us. He liked to sit for an hour or two with a glass of Gosartan. It soon became clear that this is a very sociable man who does not mind to sit with his officers until late at night, ranting about the upcoming battles. From time to time von Daniels was carried away by pipe dreams and clearly inflamed by the great ideas and plans of the Führer. He was one of those commanders I knew well who liked to refer to Hitler. Gentlemen, you know that the fur is quite clear. We, the commanders, did not let ourselves be drawn into the whirlpool of his thoughts and plans. For me, numerous small assignments were very useful, which gave me the opportunity to travel frequently around the country. One day we went to Bordeaux, planning to end the trip in Arcacon. I wanted to see that piece of land where famous French artists found their best subjects. However, the stay in Bordeaux was a disappointment. The harbour buildings on both sides of the Garonne had lost their appeal. The signs of war were everywhere. The bustling business life that used to be on the docks had come to a standstill. Dozens of ships of varying tonnage stood at anchor. Only in a few places there was loading and unloading. These were barges, which at best could run to the mouth of the Gironde. In two years no large vessel had entered or left the port. Seeing a few ocean-going steamers, caught here by the outbreak of war, had since anchored with their hatches battened down, covered with rusty patches. Between them, naval vessels were visible, patrol and air defence vessels. The streets leading into the harbour were equally bleak. Businesses were dead, unable to be put to work in the service of the war economy. Commercial offices were closed, and some of the premises were used by the Germans for various purposes. It was clear from the smoky enamelled signs, and the signs of the trading companies that there used to be a brisk trade in grain, Sugar, phosphates, timber, machinery, chemicals, salt, and, of course, wine. Wine of different varieties, and of every quality was a specialty of the land here. However, German tanks were not only shooting at the vineyards, they were also irradiating them, playing out training attacks. Nothing could keep me and Oberlutten Streng, an art lover in this large town. Our attempts to make contact with the locals were unsuccessful. We were secretly impressed by the calm, reserved, and terse manner in which they pushed us away without being impolite. Everyone did so. The bookseller, the priest, the road labourer, as well as the teacher and the housewife in the meagre Sunday market. When we arrived at our kitchen, it was already full tide. Like a giant bowl, lay before us an almost circular bay with fishing boats tilted in the mud and an endless row of piles for oyster cages. The mirror of the bay, with its innumerable narrow water channels and muddy marshes, shimmered ash grey, and beyond it a bluish strip of forest could be seen in a vague transition from land to sky. The sound of the waves came from the sea. We slowly climbed to the high ridge of sand dunes that stretched along the shore and away to the south. From the summit the abyss opened before us and the forest below irresistibly swept by the sand. To our right the surf raged. Huge waves came furiously upon each other and dark blue broke up, forming at the foot of the dunes blurred strips, which crossing cast a bright, blinding glare. A sandstorm swept over us, the wind picking up light yellow grains of sand that settled on the coniferous forest, forming dunes there as well. Suddenly smoke rose above the forest, small puffs of smoke at first, and within minutes the forest was burning brightly, the fire slowly spreading southward. Such fires had been frequent in recent weeks. One of my battalion was called in to fight forest and step fires, but on orders from above the battalion was withdrawn, as even hundreds of soldiers could not cope with the fires, which were the fault of the Wima. The forest fires continued, this time in a sparsely populated area. The French Forest Fire Department was organised and during the war as well as possible. For generations, especially during this hot season, the locals had to protect their only wealth, 
the resin which had been the source of their main income for many years. So why didn't they want to know us Germans? One can only wonder at such a question. There was not a single locality north or south of the Gironde where German crimes were not known. Streng, who had no idea of the mood of the French, imagined the first meeting with them quite differently. The Atlantic Rampart. In the meantime, our division was already equipped with everything necessary for action in the field and fully manned. We had yet to visit the Atlantic coast, and we had to hurry. I took Oberleutnant Urban with me. He was delighted, for he had never seen the ocean, and he was attracted to everything that had to do with cultural history and historical traditions. He marvelled at the landscapes, the medieval castles and temples, the parks, vineyards and flowering gardens. My orderly, a soldier in his twenties, who reminded me vividly of my first valet when I served as a lieutenant in 1917, also went with us. He was excited about the trip. Travelling as part of the We Are Marked, that was a common slogan for army recruitment at the time. I was drawn to Sept. There is still the triumphal Arch of Germanicus, located on the banks of the Charent, the remains of a huge Roman arena and the Church of Notre Dame, completed around 1000 AD, rich in Moorish elements. It was all worth seeing. However, due to lack of time, we only had a cursory look at Notre Dame and the Arc de Triomphe. There were 60 kilometres to the coast. In an hour we passed Marines and soon found ourselves at the rugged steep shore of Les Tremblade. Here came the breath of the ocean. Beyond the horizon, on the other side of the bay, a lighthouse appeared. And here we were on the steep shore. The sound of the surf covered everything. Without delay, we moved through Marennes and Rochefort in La Rochelle to the old fishing harbour, with its famous bastion, the Tower of St. Nicholas. And separated from it by a narrow fairway standing opposite the Tower de Lay chain. The stagnant water stank of stale, putrid air. From time to time a strong cold wind blew from the sea, and here we caught the low tide. Many fishing boats sank into the liquid mud. The things are between the towers in the open sea we could see fanciful silhouettes. Deck superstructures, rigging furled red-brown sails. The cries of seagulls mingled with the creaking of winches. The outline of the Isle de Re seemed visible in the dim glass. It had once been the last stop on the way to the dreaded Cayenne. Among the old fortifications was the prison of St. Martin de Ari, a typical construction of Vauban, the master of fortifications. Over the centuries, these prison towers have been visited by both fiery patriots and bandits. In front of us was history itself, a history that contained much enslavement, power struggles, conquests. What happened next? Had I not previously visited French soil as one of the conquerors? Had I, then, while inspecting works of art in French cathedrals, considered the feelings of the French, and what is the stu, the service du travail obligatoire, those posters we saw here in the harbour, but the obligation of the civilian population of a conquered country to work in the country of the conquerors? I involuntarily remembered my conversations with my father on international law, because they did not teach such things in German military schools. So here in France, the occupation regime did not consider international law and the laws of war as it was everywhere where German soldiers appeared. Where could all this lead to? On the way back, we stopped again for a little rest. The ordinarian and the driver had gone to wander along a hedge of briars near a cottage from which the sounds of a harmonica could be heard. How good is this peace and the sun pouring its rays? I watched Urban. He was quiet, apparently trying again to solve a difficult problem. Or perhaps the same thing was happening in him as in me. The few hours on the coast had left an unpleasant residue. So, Urban, how does it all look? I tried to strike up a conversation. For a long time afterward, the Oberlutent's answer kept me in suspense. Here, on the ocean shore, are the Germans, and with them the Austrians. But he, as a resident of Vienna, he, let us say it straight for once, Urban remarked, cannot think as a German thinks if he wanted to. I could not grasp what Urban meant. Then he asks, Mr. Colonel, do you think we are going to stay here on the ocean forever? Are we not here temporarily, so to speak? Such a question could not be left unanswered and evaded. I did not answer at once. I had to reflect. I, th I answered that there is no such thing as an unchangeable forever in history, especially if any purpose is accomplished by war. France is not Germany, and only six months ago there was already a roll call of civil administration for Moscow. And now we are further away from fulfilling that goal than ever before. Isn't that so? 
and will France reconcile itself to such a system as exists in Mussolini's Italy? It is difficult to imagine it, and will it not be temporary, so to speak, as you Viennese say, last for a very long time? The fortifications on the coast were scarcely visible. One could only guess about them. They were either well camouflaged, or in consequence of carelessness, there were very few of them. It seemed that one could feel safe before so insurmountable an obstacle as the ocean. So far the course of the war had proved the Fuhrer right. After all, it was said that the Allies will break their teeth and about the Atlantic rampart. Meanwhile on the shore, almost as in peacetime, there was resort life. It was not difficult to see who was lounging in the sun on the sandy shore of the Sable d'Olon. We, the representatives of the new order in Europe, we will teach you, sons of the Grandee nation, to work. Have you not yet realized the purpose of our huge submarine bunkers, including those at Saint-Nazaire? The Atlantic Ocean off the coast of France is ours and will remain ours. All that failed in 1918 will now be made up for. We have the right of the German nation and Orion demands on our side, and you, the products of the crossbreeding of migrating nomadic peoples, are neither fish nor flesh. What has become of your race? This is the kind of reasoning we heard on the beach where the German officers were lounging. As for race, it's a fact. The officers chattered. The French are degenerate. But the girls are lovely. Slim as a poplar, of course we have to exercise restraint. Excesses must not lead to quarrels. At commander's meetings, categorical instructions were given on this subject. Strict control on the beach. It is good that at night all cats are grey. It is difficult to distinguish what rank who has. A few days ago, one Obermayat was seized in the best house, in Kakadu. It was the sensation of the day. The simpleton had to save a lot of money in order to have a fancy meal. He passed himself off as a resident. It was hushed up. There, behind the dunes, in bungalows and small villas, are headquarters, and the area is not visible. The petty officer was released. It turned out that he is from a minesweeper such a team. This is not nothing. Drifting mines often come here as well. A few weeks ago, Allied warships attempted a surprise raid on a breakwater near Olon, probably a test manoeuvre. All military clubs along the resort coast were immediately closed and headquarters were moved farther to the rear. The next morning we drove through Nantes to St. Nazar. Out of the blue-grey haze appeared first, like a coulee, the outlines of island-topped roofs and factory chimneys. In front of the dark blue silhouette, like toy shops and warehouses peeped through. All around, everything seemed like a huge military construction site. The giant concrete hulk was the submarine shelter that had been talked about so much. We were allowed to tour it. After daylight, we found ourselves in a kind of semi-darkness. At first, it was difficult to orient ourselves. Spotlights, machines, units, sparks were flying from welding machines. Gradually, the eyes got used to it. The gigantic size of the construction became clear. Along the longitudinal rib, wide enough to lay a narrow-gauge railroad. We passed to the hydraulic iron gates that divided the bunker into several basins. In the meantime, the tide had begun to ebb again. Below at our feet was the submarine. In front of us was the fighting deck house, and below were the torpedo tubes, signalling devices, and deck superstructures. Apparently, the gigantic size of this reinforced concrete tank was determined by the difference in water surface levels at low tide. The only vulnerability seemed to be the undercarriage leading to the ocean, but it was well protected by anti-aircraft artillery, steel netting against drifting mines and possibly torpedoes. Such, therefore, was the Atlantic rampart, touted as insurmountable. But France and Belgium had no less hope for the Maginot Line, and how quickly that line was overcome. At night we were returning to our unit. I sat next to the driver, watching how confidently and cautiously he drove the car over unfamiliar terrain and I thought about the responsibility of an officer in relation to the soldiers, vestops, communicators, gunners. I remembered the defeat of the German army, the Battle of Moscow, the soldiers frozen in light overcoats, but could a German officer afford such reflections?